everybody. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to photograph the upcoming annular eclipse. And this is going to be a bit different than the total eclipse that many of us saw in 2017. The main difference here is that you're not going to see the corona or some of those other cool events, but it's still going to be a wonderful show. So today, I want to make sure you know what filters to buy to keep your camera safe as well as your eyes. We'll also discuss the best camera settings, how to actually photograph the eclipse, and I'll also show you how to use a star tracker to make the entire process much easier. First, I want to make sure your eyes are properly protected, because as you know, you might damage your eyesight looking at the sun. Now, you could just go out and spend 10 or 15 bucks and get a box of those cardboard glasses, but I actually recommend you spend a little bit more and get something a bit more comfortable. For example, I found these guys on Amazon, the Eclipser HD, and they're just like a normal pair of sunglasses, but instead of glass, they almost have like a mylar film. And when you look through here, it's pitch black, but if you look up at the sun, you're gonna see a really nice orange hue to it. And really that's the only thing you're gonna see with these on. So I'd recommend, if you wanna have a more comfortable experience, get something like this. You don't have to get this brand in particular, this is just the one I found. And I think this is gonna be a lot better than those cheap cardboard glasses. So that'll keep your eyes safe. And while we're on the topic of keeping things safe, whenever you're gonna be doing any type of photography of the sun or even using binoculars, you always want to filter at the front of your optics. So you wouldn't want to put a filter near your camera sensor or somewhere in your image train. It always needs to be at the front. The same would be true if you're using binoculars. You wouldn't want to wear binoculars with these glasses. There's a chance it could still damage things. So you might want to find some filters that would fit over the front of your binoculars as well. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about protecting your camera. Because you can imagine if you've got pure sunlight coming right in through that lens, it can melt your sensor if you're not careful. So you need to get a certified solar filter. And there's a lot to choose from out there. I know I've spent over $300 just in the past week trying to find something that works well. And I hope that after spending all that money, I can at least save you some money and tell you what works and what doesn't. First up, we have these kind of cardboard filters like this, where you can buy a few of them for 20 or 30 bucks. This is the option I started off with thinking it would work well and it'd be inexpensive. However, I was not impressed with them, as you might imagine. The cardboard itself was a bit difficult to fold into the shape that you need. The film is kind of stretched and bent now, and it's already starting to fall apart, even though I barely mess with the thing too much. Another problem with these cardboard filters is that if you just go and put it right on the front of your lens, and there's even a slight gust of wind, this thing's gonna blow right off. So imagine you're pointing your telescope or your lens up at the sun, this thing blows off, and now you have that sunlight going right into your camera. Again, it could destroy it very quickly. For this reason, I do not recommend the cardboard filters. I understand you can always tape it to your lens or rubber band it, but you know, it just does not feel very quality, as you might imagine. So for that reason, I think you're better off investing a little bit more money to get a better product. Next up, we have a filter from Thousand Oaks Optical. This is a threaded filter. And this is actually what I used for the 2017 total eclipse. The way it works is it almost looks like a aluminum foil or mylar or something. But there's some threads on here and you would just screw that on the front of your telephoto lens. If you're not sure what your filter size is on your lens, you can either look on the lens body itself, it should tell you, or you can just Google it and you'll be able to find it pretty quickly. For example, my Tamron 150 to 600 has a 95 millimeter filter thread. So I went over to Thousand Oaks Optical, purchased this filter, and now I don't have to worry about it blowing off from a slight gust of wind. I can screw it on there. I know it's going to be safe for the duration of the eclipse. The only downside with the threaded filters is if you plan on doing the total eclipse, because in that scenario, you're actually gonna have to unscrew the filter right when you hit totality. And I can tell you from experience, that is not fun. There's a lot going on, you're pretty excited, you're not even really thinking clearly, and trying to unscrew a filter is pretty difficult actually. Now for the annular eclipse, we can leave the filter on for the entire event, so this really isn't a concern. But my point here is that if you plan on doing multiple total eclipse sessions, then this might not be the best idea. But if the annular eclipse, this will work just fine. Finally, we have my recommended filter for everybody, which also comes from Thousand Oaks Optical. But this guy is like a solar film. I forget the exact name. But basically, you find the outer diameter of your dew shield on your lens or telescope. My SpaceCat telescope has an outer diameter of about 80 millimeters. So I went over to Thousand Oaks Optical, found the nearest corresponding size, which in this case went up to about 81 millimeters, and I purchased that filter. When it arrived, 
it came with a little felt strip in the box. So what I had to do is install that felt strip right on the inside of this. Then I could easily slide it right on the end of my telescope and I have a secure connection. And the great thing is they make these in a huge variety of sizes. So regardless of the optic you're using, even a big telescope, you should be able to find a compatible size. The big thing again is that you're measuring the outer diameter of your dew shield because this will fit right over the end. And I think this is the best of everything because it's gonna sit on your lens securely. It's not gonna blow off. But if you're photographing the total eclipse, you don't have to worry about unscrewing it. You just pull it right off and you can start taking those total eclipse photos. Therefore, I think this is the best investment you can make. All right, now that we've covered filters, let's move on to your camera settings. One of the great things about the annular eclipse is you can use the same camera settings throughout the entire event, unlike the total eclipse. So what I want you to do is go out on any sunny day and practice what I'm about to show you. First, grab your solar filter, attach it to the front of your lens, either the threaded filter or the solar light filter I showed you. When your solar filter is safely installed, then we can move on. And the first thing I want you to do is put the camera on manual mode. That way we can independently control the aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Next, we're gonna put the ISO to 100. From there, we can adjust our aperture. And this is really gonna depend on the lens that you're using. For example, when I zoom into 600 millimeters, my aperture can only go as wide as f6.3. So that's where I'm gonna be at. You might have a lens that could stay at f4 though, so that would be fine as well. I would just say anywhere between f5.6 and f8 is a sweet spot for this kind of thing. I wouldn't go any higher than f8 because you might lose some image sharpness. I wouldn't go any wider than f4 either because then you might be laying too much light in if that's even possible with some of these solar filters. So if you just want a number, put the camera to like f8. Everybody should be able to do that and that should work fine. Now we're ready to talk about shutter speed. And this is actually pretty simple. What you want to do is, again, make sure your solar filter is properly attached. Find where the sun is at. Then aim your camera up towards the sun. Let's say it's over there for right now. Now we'll turn on live view. And with live view turned on and your lens all the way zoomed out, you should be able to see the sun somewhere there in the field of view. If not, loosen your ball head, move it around until you find it. Now we're gonna adjust our shutter speed. Very simply just turn the shutter speed dial one way or the other until the image is properly exposed. You want a really nice deep red orange color for the sun. This is really going to depend on the filter that you have though. For example, when I use that cardboard filter I showed you originally, my shutter speed was close to 1 500th of a second. But with the threaded filter, my shutter speed is down to 1 40th of a second. It's pretty crazy how much that can differ. Either way, again, you're just going to use your shutter speed dial to find the perfect exposure. And there we go. Now, because I'm going to be using the threaded filter for this lens, if I'm at 1 40th of a second, F63 ISO 100, that's okay, but that shutter speed is awfully slow, which means if I'm coming over here clicking the shutter button, I could very well have camera shake in my images. Therefore, if you're in a similar situation, I'd recommend you find a way to have a faster shutter speed. And I can't really make the aperture any wider. All that's left is the ISO. If I increase the ISO to maybe 800 or even 1600, that will allow me to increase the shutter speed to close to 1 640th of a second. Here's the way I want you to think about this. If you have a 600 millimeter lens, you generally want your shutter speed to be roughly the same speed as your focal length. In other words, if I'm at 600, I want my shutter speed to be at least 1 600th of a second. That'll guarantee there's no camera shake due to your slow shutter speed. Now, if you're gonna be using an external remote and a tripod, which obviously I'd recommend, then you don't quite have to go that fast. You could probably be at half of your focal length. So in this case, like 1 320th of a second, that would probably be fine. That would also allow you to lower your ISO to something a bit more reasonable. Maybe ISO 400, for example. But you're just going to do these slight adjustments until the sun still looks good and your shutter speed is fast enough. And the best part is, on any clear day, you can go out and practice and you can really find the settings that work well for you. Then when the eclipse happens, you already know exactly what to do. You're going to use pretty much the exact same settings. Another setting to consider is autofocus. Because if the camera's trying to focus through that thick filter, it's probably going to fail. Therefore, I'd recommend you turn off your autofocus, put the camera on full manual focus. Then with the help of live view, you can zoom in on the sun, turn your focus ring slightly until it's as sharp as possible. At this point, you're now ready to photograph the eclipse, which we'll talk about next. We are now ready to photograph the annular eclipse. You already know your camera settings, you've got your filter figured out. 
really all you have to do again is start off at your widest field of view, turn on live view, look for the sun, get it centered up as close as you can, zoom in. Once you're zoomed in and you got the sun centered up, if you still have live view on, zoom in all the way in your live view, focus your lens as close as you can to a really nice sharp image. Now, with your camera settings dialed in and the live view preview looking good, all that's left is to start an interval. You can either do this through the camera's built-in menu or through an external remote. For me personally, I'm gonna be using my Nikon D780, which has a really great built-in intervalometer. That'll prevent me from even having to worry about a remote dangling from the camera. So that's what I'm gonna do. For this, I go into my camera's photo shooting menu, look for interval timer shooting, reset everything if I need to. And when it comes to your interval, this is something you wanna think about on your own. Because I'm thinking maybe if I put it to every five minutes, that should capture all the stages of the eclipse very nicely without overloading my SD card. The only caveat to that is once you get close to that quote unquote total eclipse where the moon is right over the sun, I would stop the interval and start firing off a bunch of photos manually. That way I know I capture some really great shots of that event. Then once the moon has begun to move off from the center of the sun, you can restart your interval and let it run every two, three, maybe even five minutes. Another thing to consider is that if you're gonna be firing photos away manually by clicking the shutter, you can really shake this thing and ruin your shots. So it'd be better to either have a wired or wireless remote or turn on a timer delay. That way, after you click the shutter button, you have things settle down for about five seconds and then it takes the photo. But if you don't have one yet, it's probably not a bad idea to get a remote just for this eclipse because you can always use it for other types of photography. That way I can sit here and just manually trigger the shutter with a remote rather than having to touch the camera. And if you haven't done so yet, make sure you turn on manual focus. Because if this interval is going through and autofocus is turned on, it's going to probably have blurry photos because it can't focus through the filter. Or it might not even take your images because it can't achieve focus. Again, the camera has to be manually focused for this. All right, so if you've been practicing along with me out there on a sunny day, you've already noticed a problem. And that is you could have the sun centered up perfectly, but within two or three minutes, it's going to drift down to the right or maybe up to the left. And within five minutes, it's gonna be completely out of the frame. That means you have to come over here, readjust your ball head, get it centered up, and everything down and take some more photos. This is gonna get very annoying. I can tell you from experience. During the 2017 eclipse, I was out here every two or three minutes, constantly readjusting the camera, rather than sitting back and enjoying the show. And that's the last thing I want for you. I want you to be able to sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and not have to fiddle with this camera nearly as much. So with that said, to make your life easier, I recommend you get a star tracker, which will keep the sun centered up from the beginning of the eclipse to the end. If you're not familiar with star trackers yet, they're pretty simple. What you need to do is align it to the North Celestial Pole, which in the Northern Hemisphere. That's the exact spot in the sky where all the stars seem to rotate around. When the tracker is lined up to that spot, you can turn it on, attach your camera, aim wherever you want to, and now your camera is gonna follow the motion of the sun, the moon, the stars, whatever you want to photograph. Now, because we're doing the solar eclipse, we've actually got it pretty easy. You know, we're not trying to take five minute exposures of some distant galaxy. The only reason we're using the tracker is just to keep the sun centered up over the span of a few hours. Therefore, if you understand a little bit about star trackers, you don't have to be too worried about your polar alignment. As long as it's fairly close, that's gonna work fine. If you don't know what a polar alignment is, then I recommend you check out some of the other videos here on my YouTube channel. I've got dozens of videos on how to use a star tracker. I've also got full courses on my website, which will teach you how to photograph the Milky Way or deep space objects. So if you still have questions, that's gonna be one of the best ways to learn. Anyway, getting back on track, the number one question I get with star trackers is how do I do my polar alignment during the day? Because we don't have any stars to help us do our alignment. So there's really three different ways you can approach this. I'll start with the easiest and move up from there. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, there's an app called Polar Scope Align Pro. If you buy the higher end version, there's actually a feature in there for daytime alignment. Unfortunately, I don't have an Apple device with me to show you how this works, but basically, you would place your phone or iPad right here on top of the tracker, turn on the daytime alignment tool, and it's gonna tell you how to adjust your screws here. You're either gonna turn things left or right to move the tracker left and right, or up and down, and you'll see this correspond on the reticle on the app. Then, once you've got it as close as possible, you've done your polar alignment during the day. Again, that's gonna be your easiest solution. If you're like me though and you don't have an Apple device, the next best idea is to go out the night before and do your polar alignment when the stars are actually visible. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but as long as you can kind of sight up the North Star right over the top of it, 
you make sure your tripod's nice and level, not if it's some weird angle. And then from there, once you have it aimed up at Polaris, just double check that your latitude is correct. So for this, you can always load up Google Maps or something, drop a point right next to your location. In my case, I'm at about 48 degrees north. So I can dial in that latitude right here on the base. And now I'm angled up right where I need to be. Ideally, you can just leave your tracker right here, point it up towards Polaris all night long, come out in the morning, attach your gear, and begin photographing the eclipse. I realize that's not going to be feasible for everybody though. So another idea is maybe get some tape or some rocks and place them around each one of the tripod legs exactly where they are right now. That'll allow you to pack everything up, but when you come out the next morning, that stuff should still be there. You can set up right where you were and then go on from there. Finally, if you can't go out at night whatsoever and you just have to do it the day of, really there's two tips I can give you. The first, again, is to get your latitude from Google Maps. Dial that in here on the base that we are angled up to the right spot. Then you have to find north. Now this is true north, not magnetic north. So I'm sure you can find an app that's going to show you which way true north is, provide your GPS is correct. Then you just kind of sight it up as close as you can to where you think true north is, make sure everything's level, and that's the best you can do. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Understand that even if your polar alignment's kind of off, what that translates to is that the sun might drift over the span of 30 minutes rather than two minutes. Either way, that's still going to be vastly better than just using a tripod and ball head. It'll make your experience more enjoyable. One final tip is that if you do have the ability to go out the night before, at least use that to get your bearings. Figure out where the North Star is at. That way when you come back in the day, you can use the same landmarks, get kind of acquainted and say, okay, remember last night the North Star was above that cliff right over there. And that would be just another way to make this polar alignment during the day a bit easier. Either way, once you've done a rough polar alignment during the day, the next step is to turn on the star tracker, put it to the solar tracking speed, then we could grab our counterweight kit and our camera. All right, so I've got my camera with the little bracket attached. I can now install this on my declination kit right here. And once you've got it securely attached, I'd recommend you balance the counterweight kit. That'll just put less stress on the motor because you will have it running for a few hours. So there we go, it's already pretty well balanced. Neither side's pulling down. Another thing you have to remember is that we've already done our polar alignment. So we cannot move the tripod anymore. If you do, that'll ruin the alignment and screw everything up. Anyway, with all of our things looking good, we can now turn our camera using the clutch here on the front and the declination piece up top here. And we just want to get the sun centered up, which technically is going to be something like this if we're shooting the total eclipse, or in this case, the annular eclipse. All right, so we now have, let's say the sun centered up. We use the live view feature to help do that. And with the sun centered up at our widest focal length, we'll zoom in. We can adjust our composition slightly to get the sun centered back up again. If things look good though, we'll tighten everything down. And if your tracker's running, you're all set. Now, whatever your current composition is, it should maintain that for the duration of the eclipse, assuming your polar alignment was fairly decent. Again, if your polar alignment's off, then the sun's gonna drift. It might take 20 or 30 minutes though, compared to two or three minutes. But from here, you just dial in your camera settings as we discussed. In my case, it's around, let's say ISO 400, F63, one three hundredth of a second. We've turned off the autofocus. Now we can connect our remote or go into our interval timer shooting and get that configured. As I said, I recommend a photo every two, three, maybe even five minutes, just so you get that full sequence of events. To be clear, you can leave the filter on for the entire duration of the eclipse. This is not the total eclipse where you'd have to take it off. So you're fine leaving the filter on, using the same camera settings the entire time. And that's gonna do it. You can now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. We've pretty well automated the entire process. The camera's gonna take the photos that it needs to. The tracker's gonna keep that sun centered up. That means we can just sit back and enjoy the show. And that's what I'd recommend because this entire workflow was developed to make it easier on yourself. One of my main regrets, as I said, from the 2017 eclipse is I was constantly fiddling with the camera, even during the total eclipse. And I really didn't get to enjoy the show as much as I wanted to. But that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed the video and now you feel much more comfortable photographing the eclipse. My final word is that you can go out and practice this on any sunny day. And I'd recommend doing that. Get comfortable with your camera settings, get comfortable doing the rough polar alignment, focusing, and more. 
That way when the eclipse actually happens, you know exactly what to do and there's no stress. Finally, if you're going to be using a dedicated astro camera and a go-to mount, it's actually way more complicated. So I'm going to save that for another video. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.